All right, and welcome to another week. I always, every time this happens, I feel like a YouTuber or like a podcaster. It's like, welcome back, guys, to another week of enrichment class. <laughs> I feel so special when this happens. Okie dokes. Uh, this week we have Graham Cohen. Graham, why don't you introduce yourself? All righty, hi, everybody. So my name is Graham Cohen. Uh, right now I live in South Orange, New Jersey. I'm in my third year uh, at the Juilliard School. I'm a, a viola major there, um, but I also spent uh, seven years in Juilliard's pre-college division where I was a uh, music composition major. Um, I did play a lot of viola there as well, but that was my uh, main focus was composition. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time doing viola, a lot of time doing composition. Uh, I started on violin when I was younger and um, I still do play a bit of violin as well. So it's a little about me. Uh, so Graham, tell us about Juilliard pre-college. Like what's that like, how did you get in? Yeah, so Juilliard pre-college is a Saturday program. So it's not like a, um, it's not like a arts high school or something like that. It's actually basically an extracurricular type activity. So. It's a Saturday program, but you're there from, my classes used to start around 8.30 in the morning, and I would have class sometimes until seven o'clock at night. So it was a pretty busy and packed day there, but um, you know, so the Juilliard Pre-College Division, what I would say, they kind of divide it up into a few different groups, especially for orchestral instruments. Um, I did play in the orchestra, although I wasn't a viola major there and they have the orchestra for everyone who's um, below high school, so everyone who's uh, ninth grade and younger. Then they have another group for ninth and 10th grade and another group for 11th and 12th grade. And for the most part, you end up playing with people who are basically around your same age. Um, and you, in addition to having orchestra and chamber music classes, um, everybody takes music theory, everybody takes ear training, um, and then you can kind of take a bunch of different electives. I took stuff on music history. Um, I took classes specifically about some of my favorite composers. Um, overall, it's, it is an intense experience, but I would say it's a very worthwhile and very fun experience. It's a very supportive environment. Did you have to audition to get in? Yes, yes. So when I was, um, when I was 11 years old in, in 2010, I auditioned for the Juilliard pre-college division and I auditioned, um, I never auditioned on viola for anything except for the, well, I, I did orchestra auditions, but I didn't have to audition for viola as I wasn't a major. But for the composition audition, uh, what they had you do um, is you would go into this room with all of the other people who were applying to be a composition major and the, one of the teachers would write out on the board a few different musical ideas. So you would write out, a, uh, he would write out a few different things that you could choose from, and then you would go into a room and have two and a half hours to basically write a piece of music based off of one of those things that was put up on the board. Uh, so, it, I mean, you didn't have to write an entire piece, but essentially they wanted to see what you could come up with when they just kind of gave you a blank slate. Here's a little tune, here's a rhythm, here's something to base your piece off of. And um, in addition, you would have kind of an interview with them where you would talk to them about writing music and all the things that you like to do, favorite composers. Uh, you would play an instrument for them to prove that you were not completely incapable of actually playing music. Uh, so. I, I played uh, violin at the time, so I played violin in my audition, actually. Um, but, so it's a pretty intense audition, I will say that. Um, for, I know for instrumentalists, it's a little different. It tends to be like a 15, 10, 15 minute audition where you just come in and play a couple of different pieces for them. But the composition audition is pretty intense. So, what would be some advice you would give to somebody starting out for Juilliard pre-college? I think we have a couple of kids in here 
who um, I can at least see like two or three who have been thinking about pre-college in general, maybe not Juilliard specifically, but what is some advice you can give somebody who wants to go that path? Absolutely. So, um, so I would say in addition to Juilliard pre-college, they have um, in New York City, there are also pre-college divisions at the Manhattan School and Manus, which is at the new school in New York City. And those are kind of the big three um, pre-college division. Sorry, my cat. Uh, those are the big three pre-college divisions in New York City. Um, so my advice for someone who might want to look into this is basically you, you have to think about the amount of time that you're going to be dedicating um, to your instrument and to um, music in general. So if you are really interested in music, even if it's not necessarily something you want to do as your eventual career later on in life, if you're really interested in music and want to have a in-depth experience, I think pre-college is one of the best ways um, to do that. And I would just say, make sure you practice and you really know your pieces before you go into the audition. Um, try and prepare your best and it's a really great experience. It's a lot of fun and it's a really supportive environment to learn about music. Willie had a great question. He asked, is it really expensive? And I'm going to, I'm going to go on top of that and I'm going to ask, are there scholarship opportunities? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I personally don't know about the other, um, the cost of the other schools, but I know that Juilliard pre-college is rather expensive. It's about $10,000 a year, which is, um, at least it was when I, uh, when I was going there. And so it is definitely expensive. Um, so they do have scholarship opportunities available. And um, certainly when I went there, I was the recipient of, um, over the years, I had a couple of different scholarships, but they were always extremely helpful in um, giving you scholarship opportunities. And additionally, if you have more um, financial um, if you would have more financial problems with that, they also have what is called the Music Advancement Program or MAP. And the Music Advancement Program at Juilliard Pre-College costs, I, know, I don't know the exact number, but I know it costs a lot less. And it is specifically for people who might have more financial challenges. Um, but what I would also say is that it, it is very expensive, but it you really kind of are getting the whole experience and it's, for me, I mean, I think that it is very worth it because it actually, when you look at an entire school year of hour long lessons once a week, um, when you kind of add it all up with some of those individual private teachers, if you tried to just have private lessons with them for a year, it might end up costing that much. But in addition, you get orchestra, you get chamber music, you get ear training and theory. So um, it, it is very expensive, but uh, there are other they, they, they do offer opportunities for people who need financial assistance. So moving on from pre-college to actual college, can you give us like a sample schedule of what a Juilliard full day would be like, like a jam-packed day? Yeah, so, um, so I can basically tell you uh, probably my, my busiest semester that I had was, um, I would say the, during my sophomore year, that tends to be the really busy year. So a schedule on one of those days might look something like you have your academic classes typically in the morning and early afternoon. Um, so I might have a class, uh, every class is about 75 minutes long. So I might have a class at 1030, go and have some lunch, have another class at 1 p.m. And then you practice a little bit and then you might have a two hour long chamber rehearsal uh, with your quartet or your trio or whatever you're playing in. And then after all of that, you go and get a little dinner and then you would have orchestra from seven until 10 o'clock at night. Um, so there are definitely days like that where you are basically in the building for about 12 hours straight with no break, um, except a little time to eat. So that does happen from time to time. Um, what I would say is that is not every day or every week though. That tends to happen when you're really coming up on a lot of performances, um, you know, orchestra concerts, chamber concerts, things like that, but it can be very busy. 
So I remember when I was in college, I would probably put in at minimum five hours ish for practicing like a day. But I can't imagine what it's like to be going to Juilliard because I feel like you'd have to do more on some days and like maybe cram in. Like I always tell my students, it's not the amount of time you put in, it's the amount of work you put in. That's being the smart way. Can you talk to us a little bit about practicing? <laughs> yeah, practicing, practicing. That's a, uh, that is a contentious topic among Juilliard students. Uh, we do have some people at Juilliard, I would say especially pianists, who like to practice for like eight, nine, ten hours a day, which personally is a foreign concept to me because I could never do that. But um, basically, in terms of practice, it again, it really depends on the day. Uh, there are some days during my freshman year, I would say on average, I practiced about four hours a day. Um, but there would be days when I literally wouldn't have time to practice because I would be going from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And I would have six or seven or eight hours of rehearsal in one day. Um, the important thing, and I can, I can speak to this because last year I developed a neck injury from over playing. Um, you do have to be careful, even if we're just playing uh, string instruments, that you don't do like 10, 11 hours in a day for several days in a row, which is what I did, and that did not work out so well. Um, but there are some days when you'll have so much rehearsal that you literally can't practice. In general now, I do try to do about three hours of practicing a day, but I have so, I, in my normal life, not nowadays, but um, in my normal life, there's usually a lot of rehearsal as well. So I try to be careful and balance the amount of practicing I do to the amount of rehearsal I have. So the day I don't have a rehearsal, I can practice four hours, five hours, but if I don't, but if I have a lot of rehearsal, I scale it back. So can you teach us some cool stuff that you learned at Juilliard? Like give us that little uh, sprinkle of nuggets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. What I'll, what I'll tell you now just a little bit. Um, so when I first started at Juilliard pre-college, I had just switched to viola. Uh, I, I literally, I think, got my viola, 13 inch viola in the mail, like a week before school started. Um, and I was studying viola at the time with um, Kenji Bunch. Um, and he was a wonderful teacher. He ended up moving away when I was 13. And uh, so I transferred at that time to study with Toby Apple, who is still currently my teacher, and he is kind of amazing, and he's just a wonderful, amazing teacher. So when I first started out with him, uh, the first thing he said to me is, you know, all right, so I'll, I'll take you as a student for sure, but we're going to have to fix everything that you do and make it better. And I was like, okay. That's, you know, me, I'm like, okay, fine, sure. And so um, for the, about the first six months of studying with him, I didn't actually play any solo music. I just worked on technique with him. Um, so I'm gonna show you just a couple of fun things that we did. You can kind of play along with some of these. Um, so one of the things that he had me do was just using um, my left hand, my playing hand. And he would have me do this where you would just go one finger at a time and you would tap your finger down like this. And then you would go to your next finger, go to your next finger, go to your next finger. Can we all try? Yeah, so you would do uh, just your four playing fingers. Wrong hand. <laughs> I mean, I suppose it's useful on the other one. So he would have me do this uh, with, with my left hand, my playing hand. And um, the point of this exercise, what he was trying to help me do was develop um, develop independence of my of all of my fingers because what tends to happen is our fingers are a little bit floppy and like to move kind of together. They don't really like having a lot of independence. They kind of want to go all the same direction at the same time. So he did this with me a lot, a lot. This was also very helpful for uh, vibrato. 
for being able to move your hand. This was one that he did with me, and then he would have you do it. Sometimes you would put two fingers together and do the same thing, which is a little tricky. Sometimes he would have you do it with three. So this was basically just developing that independence of each of your fingers so that they could kind of learn to move on their own. Um, so then a couple of fun things that he did on the instrument with me. Um, I'm not going to make you do this one because it's, it's very difficult and it took me like five months to be able to actually figure out what he was talking about and how to do it. So don't feel bad if you can't do this one. Um, but he calls this his squares that you do with the bow. So he would have you take your normal bow hole, go right at the frog, and then without moving the arm, just using your wrist, you would go from this to that, which sounds beautiful, I know, and then pick it up, go back, put it back on the string. This was an exceedingly difficult exercise for me. It took me a very long time to be able to do. Um, but he would have you do this on a scale, so you would go <laughs> Basically, the point of this was bending the pinky and getting the pinky to bend and be flexible. And I know that bending your pinky is always like everybody's favorite thing to talk about because it's very hard to do. Um, but so I would do these uh, squares, which they're very difficult, but um, if you want to try them, go ahead. Another thing that he had me do, this one's a little easier and this one's pretty fun. So if you want to try this one, you certainly can. He would call this one the pendulum. So you would start out not, not playing on the string, but you would do this pendulum where you would go up, down like this. And then he would have you do it on the string, so you would go... <laughs> And then you would make the motion smaller and smaller until it turned into an off the string bow stroke, which is very creative, I think. But so when you um, when you want to uh, work on your off the string bow strokes, this is really great. You kind of start with this big motion. What's really helpful about Sorry. What's really helpful about that is that um, because off the string is such a small motion, it can be hard to really, you know, kind of understand what, what's going on. So he would do this big motion, make it smaller and smaller until you would get to this. That one's a really fun one uh, to practice. And so for about six months, I didn't really play any solo music. I was just basically doing these crazy little hand things. I would like walk around the house like a crazy person and do this all day. And um, I would do these bow things. I had some vibrato ones. I think you'll find this one funny. And I would have to do that on like every note of a C major scale for two octaves and it kind of drove me insane, but it did help me develop vibrato. It's a very good exercise, starting with a very slow, slowest you can do vibrato, speeding it up until you get to a good speed. Um, so those were just a few of some of the tricks that he taught me, and um, I'll tell you that they are exceedingly helpful for your technique. It's always good to go back and work on your basics of your technique just so that you can really reinforce it and really feel confident in your technique because with good technique kind of everything else uh, will start to fall into place a lot more easily. So Graham we have a question and I'm not sure if this is asking about pre-college or just college in general but I'm going to apply this to anything so um, for whoever applies you know there's a lot of competition out in the world um, oh, this is for college specific, specifically, but I guess this could be applied to anything. Could you give some pointers in maximizing the chances of getting into a school that you want to attend? Absolutely. So um, in terms of maximizing your chances, I think the most important thing, the most important thing is just 
not only your ac accuracy of notes, but also kind of having a um, playing musically and playing really beautifully in a way where you're not just kind of playing the notes, but you're really playing the music. And um, it does take a lot of work. So I will say that if you are doing, if you want to apply for music for college, you definitely have to, there's, there's really no way to get around the fact that you have to spend a lot, a lot of hours practicing and going over your music and learning things really well. Um, but really trying, you know, my, my teacher said this to me when I uh, told him I wanted to audition for viola um, for college and not for composition. And uh, what he said to me is he said, well, you know, when you're coming in as a freshman, they know that you're 18 years old. And most of the people on the panel have been playing the viola professionally for 30, 40, 50 years. So they know that you at 18 are not going to play perfectly. So they don't expect you to play perfectly. Certainly, you know, we all make mistakes. I made a mistake in my Juilliard audition that I will never forget because it was quite something. But, um, and, and one of the people on the audition panel actually laughed when it happened, which was even worse. But anyway, so basically spend a lot of time practicing for sure but really try and play the music as well. They're not expecting you to play perfectly, but they just wanna see that you really love the music, that you really have ideas, that you're playing musically, beautifully, telling the story, not just playing all of the right notes. Do you still compose? Yes, I do. I, um, I actually just started a new little something, which I have no idea if I will, um, do anything with, but I, I did write a piece um, last summer, a pretty pretty substantial piece for string orchestra. So I am still composing. Um, generally during the school year, I don't have quite as much time to do it as I used to when I was in uh, pre-college, but I do still compose quite a lot, yeah. I have a really strange question for you, Graham. It might be strange, I, I feel like it's a strange question, but like, what do you actually wanna be when you grow up? What do I actually want to do? Good question. Um, basically, um, my- Because I feel, I, I'm sorry, I just want to say, it's because Graham is closer to your age than my age, I think. <laughs> so like, you know, it's just like, if I were to ask Annie, hey, Annie, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, it's, it's one of those questions, like, you still have time. Yes. So I'm very curious. I, I will say you, you, you do have time. You don't have to decide when you're 18 for the rest of your life, certainly. But um, so for me, basically, there's a few elements that I really enjoy. I really enjoy performing, I really enjoy teaching, and I really enjoy writing music. So I, I try to keep my options somewhat open. I don't, I don't like to get very set on one thing. Cause I know there, there are some people at, uh, some of my friends at school who kind of are like, I need to get this position in this orchestra. And if I don't have that position in that orchestra, then my you know life is over. And I don't think that's the best way to handle your life. So I don't do that personally. I think that, um, you know, in terms of what I like to perform, the music that I really like, um, I really enjoy freelancing and playing with different groups, playing with different people. There's a wonderful um, freelance music scene in New York City. Um, I also, a uh, little side note, I really enjoy playing in pit orchestras for like musicals and opera and those types of things. So that's definitely something that I would like to do um, at least some of in my professional career. But basically um, freelance performing, uh, teaching, I really, really like teaching. Um, I, I have not so many students right now, but I really, really love teaching and as well, uh, continuing to write music. And basically my thought is that um, in terms of getting my music performed and things like that, um, if I kind of know a bunch of people and I'm working with them and I'm playing music with them, this has kind of happened to me um, naturally is you work with people, you become their friend, and then they go, hey, we'd love to do, why don't we do a piece that you wrote for, you know, do a piece that you wrote for a change. So that's kind of my concept in terms of how I see my life. I'm not, um, I'm not beholden to any 
specific, I have to get this job because I think that that's, you know, not realistic. Can you explain your composition process? Absolutely. So I think that this is a very important thing for everybody who, if, if you want to write music at all and you have any interest in that, um, I think people have this conception of how writing music works and it tends to be kind of very rigid and it's like, well, you know, you get your idea and then you have to do these specific things and you develop it in this certain way and you have to follow a form and a structure. So my brain doesn't work like that even a little bit. Um, so when I sit there and I try to like really plan everything out and be very structured and organized with it, everything just ends up sounding um, terrible. So, you know, I can do it, but it just sounds bad and not like my music. And so I don't really do that. My general composition process is just, I get an idea. I hear, you know, I hear something in my head. I have a musical idea and I just kind of play with it a little bit at the piano or on a viola or something. I'll just play with it a little bit and try to see where the idea goes. And then I just write and I just start writing. And I like to go in without too much of a formal plan or structure. Um, for some people, this you know is very sacrilegious and they don't like this way of writing music. But for me, it's the only thing that's ever worked. Um, so basically, I don't like to go in with too definitive a plan of what I'm going to do. I'll have general ideas like I'm going to do this here. You know, I want it to be this long. It's for the, these instruments. But I kind of like to just go in and start writing and see what happens. And, you know, then I can go back and I can fix it and I can make it more structured and make it work later. But until I just kind of start writing, um, nothing really tends to happen for me if I try and, you know, be too strict about it. So, oh, I had a question come in. Oh, uh, do you have to learn piano to get into music university? You do not have to learn piano to get in, but you are going to be required to learn piano while you were there. So you don't have to, um, I, I, I personally, I would recommend at least doing a little bit knowing something before you get there because if you kind of go in because I, I do have some friends who kind of went in and had like never put their hands on a keyboard before and um it becomes quite the learning curve for them it's kind of a little much so i would i would recommend doing a little bit um but you don't really have to be very good at it it's just if you can kind of get around know where the notes are um but you will have to take piano um, in school. I managed, I was very lucky. I managed to place out, but that was because I spent the entire summer before just practicing piano because I was like, I am not taking piano, secondary piano with Juilliard. I don't know why, I just didn't want to do it. So I spent the entire summer before practicing piano, like a lot, and I managed to place out. But um, in general, you do have to be able to play piano at least to graduate, you do have to be able to play piano. Yeah, William, when I went to uh, music school, I, I had to do four semesters of piano, which is two years. And I placed out of two of them. <laughs> and I still had to do four semesters. Uh, so yeah, knowing piano is helpful, but it, it's required across almost all music schools. Yep. Um, so somebody had a question. I, I'm actually gonna save this question because we're we're pushing that time. I was hoping for I'm gonna put you on the spot here for a second, Graham. Could you play us a little a little something something that maybe features the C string so we can he really hear the vast difference between violin and viola? Features the C string. Okay. I, I <laughs> have um I did have a little something that I was thinking of playing, but it does not feature the C string whatsoever. Oh, you can play both. We love hearing it. Um, Actually, you know what? Can you play something that features the C string and then you can tell us why you chose viola over violin and then you can play your other song. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, let me, okay. I know what I'll do. While you're searching it up, I just want, I can see all the violas in here. I've got like, I can count like three or four violas in here. 
and they're just cheesing away. <laughs> they're just so happy to not have like all the violin gas or, you know. I know it's very, it's very exciting to have viola. Um, so I will play just a little bit of this. This, this is, um, this, this is the uh, Vuitton's uh, viola sonata. Uh, he mostly wrote violin music, but he did write this one viola, or he wrote two viola sonatas, but this one is a beautiful piece. So I'm just going to play you the opening tune. And the opening tune um, is all on the C string. The whole first 12 bars are all on the C string. Uh, so I think that this will give you kind of a general idea of how the viola is different than the violin. Let me stand up so that you can like see what I'm doing instead of sitting in a chair. All right. OK, there we go. All right, so this is just a little bit of the Vuitton Sonata. Uh, very viola-y piece that kind of really shows off how different the viola really is than the violin. Most of the time we just play slow music instead of fast music because we're, that's kind of why we switch because, you know, who wants to play fast? <laughs> I think some of those kids, uh, some people will uh, argue with you on that one. <laughs> You're getting a lots of compliments. I think, yeah. Graham, by any chance, do you have like the turn on original sound? It is on original sound. Card. Okay, it's a little it's a little uh, underwatery sometimes, but I think I think we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could tell us why why viola instead of violin? Yeah. So basically, um, I, I will tell you a little story about how this came to be. So I did want to switch to viola. Ultimately, I liked the viola. Um, basically because I like being in the middle of the sound. So I wasn't really interested in playing the melody all the time, but I really liked being in the middle of the orchestra, the middle of the sound. I really enjoyed that. And what kind of pushed me over the edge, this was um, when I was in fourth grade, I was playing in my youth orchestra. This was, um, I, I was originally, I was born in Arizona, so I was still living there at the time. And um, so when I was in fourth grade, I got promoted. And I got promoted to first violin in my youth orchestra. And I had not played first violin for anything ever, except for when I was like six and I did something. But you know, I hadn't played first violin ever. So I was like, oh wow, I've been promoted to first violin, so exciting. I hated it with a burning passion. I was like, this is high, this is fast, I'm like, in the stratosphere. I don't know where any of these notes are. I hate this. I'm never doing this again. So I decided the best way to make sure that I never had to play first violin again was if I switched to viola. So I still, when I, when I play violin, um, unless it's for like a musical or something, I tend to tell people I'll play violin, but I don't like playing first violin. Um, so that was kind of my get out of jail free card was if I switched to viola, I wouldn't have to do that. 
of course, then you get to a certain point and you still have to play high and fast and all the crazy stuff. But in general, I just really like being in the middle of the sound. And I think it's, uh, it's different. It's definitely different than playing violin, but I really, it's very much for me, I think. Could you give us a little backstory on the next piece you're about to play? Absolutely. So I think this, this one is uh, pretty fun. So I'm going to just play the last little bit of uh, this piece by a composer whose name is Michael Kimber. Um, I actually just bought this score like two weeks ago. And this piece is called Emerald Isle, and it's based off of a bunch of different Irish fiddle tunes. And fiddling is something that I really, really like, and I really enjoy doing fiddle tunes. Um, so the last section of this piece is basically the composer just wrote um, variations and some little stuff on a fiddle tune. And this is very different than what we normally play on viola. I mean, kind of the joke is that everything we play is like slow and sad and, you know, depressing. But this is a fiddle tune on the viola. And I think it really, um, it really works well on viola to play fiddle music. So I thought I would play this. It's pretty fun upbeat piece so I hope you will enjoy this. It's called, um, so this is called McCarty's Reel. I have no idea if he made that up or if it's real but it doesn't really matter. So this is just a little bit of fiddle music on viola. <laughs> just her normal name, like Therpora, to like uh, Therpora dash, viola, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Like she wants to be known, she plays viola, and I love that. <laughs> viola is very fun. I mean, this is, this is kind of an unusual thing, but it is a really, really fun piece. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, we have a couple questions. So Laura Lee wants to know how old your viola is. And I know this is actually a very interesting question. Yes. So I just um, switched violas about a year ago to this viola. So this viola is actually very new. This viola was made in 2017. So it's only about three years old. Um, this was made by a guy named, well, funny, guy named Guy Rabu. Um, he lives in New York. He's a absolutely wonderful um, viola, and mostly viola and cello maker. And um, so this is a very new instrument. It was just made three years ago. Uh, somebody else asked, and this is kind of off topic, this is going back to composition, um, that you competed. So for, for your age, I'm going to also elaborate on this one. It says, are there any good local competitions for writing music that you could recommend? But I also want you to um, talk about competing on viola, if you've done any viola competitions or concerto competitions. Yeah, so funny, I, I have not done really a lot of competing, especially viola. I didn't, uh, uh, what I'll tell you is that I thought 
pretty much that I was going to just do composition major and I was going to play viola on the side um, until somewhere in my junior year in high school. So I did not really ever think I needed to do competitions and that sort of thing. So in terms of viola, violin stuff, I know I didn't ever really do anything. Um, my dad has an orchestra, which Sue plays in, and um, we do have a concerto competition every year for uh, young students. So I can recommend that one, just a little personal plug. Um, as for composition competitions, um, there's not a whole lot in locally um, that I know of. I know that there have been some, I entered one uh, that the New Jersey Symphony did, and they've done that a couple of times. But um, so I entered that one. I ended up having the, my piece played by them, which was really cool at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Um, so I did enter that one. I'm not familiar with too many other local ones, but I did enter in terms of composition competitions, um, kind of the two big ones, which are national, but they're the two big ones are the ASCAP um, Morton Gould Young Composers Award, uh, which I have entered many, many times, and I have won several times, but also not won several times. Um, they have two divisions. They have an under 18 and they have an 18 to 30 to I believe division. Um, so that's one of them. The other one is the uh, BMI uh, Young Composers Competitions. Those are kind of the two big internet, uh, big national compo uh, composition competitions that I've entered. Cool. Um, so I, I can see our, our interview questions are starting, but before we actually start with the real questions, I, we, everybody knows what's coming. This is the most important question. One of the most important questions you will be asked ever in an interview. Are you ready for it? I'm ready, I'm ready. What would you do if you found a penguin in your freezer? That is a great question, personally. I, I love this question. I think the first thing that you would do is be um, shocked, but I would try, I think, I would try to just take care of it a little bit and call like a local zoo or one of those types of places and say, um, we have a situation here, could you please help? Because I have no idea about penguin taking care of penguins, but I would try, I would try and like give them a fish and some water or something, you know? Would you, would you give it a hug? Of course I would. I love penguins. There's the penguin is the Juilliard mascot, so I have to really love penguins. Wait, is it really? It is. It is. I have a, um, in my room, I have a little stuffed penguin with a Juilliard shirt. We all, everything Juilliard related has penguins on it, so. Oh, oh, Graham, I know, wait, I know exactly, by the way, next time you're at Juilliard, if, if the store is open, I really want to get, this is a running joke, okay? I really want to get the hat that says um, your sports team, the Juilliard sports thing. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Juilliard. Yeah, it's Juilliard Athletics Department undefeated since 1905. Th that, <laughs> I really want one. They are amazing. I don't have one actually, but they are amazing. So the running joke is that there's no sports team at Juilliard, just in case. Just in case you guys didn't know. Absolutely none. We're all terrible. Mostly terrible at sports. Somebody asked, "How would you describe your composition style?" So, well, that's a little um, complicated. I have a bunch of different kind of styles that all encompass things that I do. Um, but basically, I write in a tonal style. I don't write kind of the modern music that people normally hear where there's kind of interesting sounds happening. That's kind of not where I'm at. I tend to like to have um, like melody, harmony, that type of stuff, but it's definitely not um, traditional, like, you know, Mozart, Beethoven type stuff. Um, so it is, um, so it's modern, modern music in that sense, but it is tonal. I have a bunch of different kind of influences and things I like. Um, I really like folk music, especially um, gamelan music from Indonesia, which is really, really cool. And you should all look up gamelan music because it's like the coolest thing ever. 
um, but I also really like uh, folk music from other different cultures, um, fiddle music. Um, I like Norwegian folk music, Chinese uh, folk music, as well as um, I really like um, jazz as an influence. Um, so I kind of have a bunch of different things that I um, kind of utilize in my arsenal of composing. Now, William asked this to, to every one of our guests, and that is, do you watch two set violin? I actually do. I, um, I haven't watched them as much like in the last couple of months, but I do, I do watch them. I have watched many, many, many of their videos. I especially, I, I can tell you my favorite ones were the ones where they were analyzing the um, playing in like TV shows and movies where like no one knows how to play an instrument and they're going like this and they're like analyzing it. And that was my favorite, I have to say. Do you have a favorite viola piece? I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> favorite viola piece. Um, well, I have, I have some pieces that I would say are some of my favorites. Um, maybe my, this actually might be my number one favorite piece would be the Rubra Viola Concerto that I played, um, which I worked on in 2018 and 19, performed in 2019 um, with my dad's orchestra back in Arizona. That, I just absolutely love that piece. Um, another piece that I really love is the Martinu Viola Sonata and the um, Mio Viola Sonata. So those are probably some of my favorites. Do you, another loaded question, do you have a favorite composer? <sighs> it changes all the time. <laughs> because it depends what I'm listening to at that moment in time and whoever, I, I have a few people that I tend to gravitate towards. Um, I can tell you right now, the person that I'm listening to the most is Steve Wright, who's a minimalist composer. And I just love kind of all of his music. I think he's, in terms of minimalism, he's like far and away the best one of the minimalist composers. He's absolutely amazing. So right now it is Steve Wright, but in, the rest of my life, I have, um, I, I think I owe a lot of debt to Sibelius for, because um, I, when I was really young, I decided that I wanted to learn the um, fourth symphony. So I copied out the whole piece in my composition software. And that kind of taught me a lot of the stuff that I know about writing music. So Sibelius is another one that's kind of very important to me, I would say. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? 100 duck-sized horses, absolutely. Because I don't want, I mean, because they're tiny. Yeah, but there's 100 of them. Think about that. I mean, that They're is tiny, but they're only as tiny as a duck. You know, and I, if you had one giant, I, I don't want, I mean, I would get my head bitten off by that. I mean, I might still end up, you know, just like completely beat by all of these things, but I would say I, I can manage better if they're smaller. I would say that. So you'd rather have many of them. You'd rather have a hundred than one giant one. I would not be able to do one giant one. I, I, I would get my head bitten off. hundred percent guaranteed. All right. That's, that's your final answer. So I feel like we're like 50-50 now, guys. I feel like 50% of them, no? I feel like a lot of them have answered one duck-sized horse, but I feel like we're kind of sort of 50-50 now on, on the people who have answered that question. <laughs> um, what's it like, <laughs> Anna Abigail? <laughs> I'll ask them that after. Um, what's it like coming from a musical family? What's it like coming from a musical family? Um, I would say in terms of my upbringing and in terms of when I was a little kid, I think it was really great for me um, going into music because when I was a little kid, I was surrounded by it constantly. My mom's a singer and my dad is a pianist and conductor. Um, so when I was a little kid, I was constantly surrounded by classical music. I had it going in the house all the time. My dad was always playing piano. My mom was singing. So I think that it is really great um, for young kids 
um, because you're kind of just surrounded by music all the time and it's really, really lovely. I, I never really knew anything else except for having music all the time. Anna and Abigail want to know if you can introduce your cat to us. I absolutely can. He's asleep, so I'm going to wake him up. He's going to be very mad at me, but it's fine. Here, let me. So, I'm sorry, Katie. You're being summoned. So, this is my very large cat. <laughs> Charlie. Here he is. He is exceedingly fluffy and very large, as you can see. He's very sweet, actually. You can see he's being very nice. Totally chill. He's like, okay, I guess I'm being held now. Um, he's a wonderful cat. I've had him since I was 10 years old. So he's getting to be an old man, but he's still, he's still my kitty. Aww. Like a very good boy right now. Very nice of him. Yeah, he's really big. He is. He is like that long. <laughs> <laughs> he's very long and very large and very heavy, but he's basically just the most chill cat ever he just is like okay he doesn't really care all right guys finish it up last few questions in the meantime graham how do you practice getting better intonation how do you practice getting better intonation okay so you have to do it a lot and you have to play very 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 slowly the slower you play the better it's going to be you have to start out just playing as slow as you can and really focusing every single note perfectly in tune so don't play any faster than you can play absolutely every note perfectly in tune and then work up your speed from there and you know you can also practice um etude books and things like that to work on your intonation play through those very slowly so that you don't have to torture yourself with your solo pieces being played at you know one eighth the tempo um so i i, I would say it takes a lot of time but it's definitely a skill that anyone can really learn <clears throat> this is a fantastic question opinions on bagpipes i, <laughs> I love bagpipes like i love them they, they're like one of my favorite instruments ever i i know this is um in december uh sue and i played a concert uh with my dad's group where um one of our conductors is a bagpipe bagpipe player he came and he played the bagpipes with us for a piece and i love the bagpipes they're like i absolutely love them so yeah, we uh, and he he was wearing his kilt and everything, and he walked out from the back of the stage with his bagpipes. It was, it was very epic. It was amazing. That was one of the best moments of my life, I think. What is your favorite ice cream? Coffee ice cream is my favorite. And it has been my favorite since I was, like, a very young child. It was like, I think it was actually the first food I ever ate was coffee ice cream. And it is my absolute favorite. Would you have wanted to start your instrument earlier? No, I don't think so. I started on violin when I was five, and I think that was a good age to start for me. Um, when I was littler than that, I don't think I would have really gained all that much if I had started younger. Um, so I started on violin when I was five. I switched to viola when I was 11. For me, I think that that was, that worked out pretty well for me. I don't think I, I would have wanted to play when I was younger. Was not, I didn't have any, you know, enough focus to be able to do it. <laughs> and the last thing, it's not even a question. Can you give us your best dog bark? Oh, oh no. <laughs> I'm very bad at these types of things. That's fine. Just go for it. Okay. Dog bark, dog bark find my inner dog. All right. Ruff, ruff. That was pretty good. Pretty good? That was, that was decent. I try. <laughs> I think it was better than Liam's last week. Well. Somebody actually said it was good. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Laura Lee wanted to ask this question. She's been asking, what's your favorite food? Quick. Favorite food is chocolate. 
hands down. It's the best food in the world, in my opinion. And on that note, we are all happy with chocolate in our lives. Guys, next week, uh, actually, before we end, can we all just give a nice round of applause to Mr. Graham Cohen? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next week's our last week. It'll be with, with me and my husband, and we're going to be doing nonverbal cues, which in other words, it's just going to be, you're going to watch us make fools of ourselves. We're going to be breaking eggs. We're going to be talking about tempo. We're going to be talking about how to breathe, all that good stuff. Yes, I heard, I saw somebody say that. Yes, we will be breaking eggs. You will see eggs be shattered. So definitely tune in, tell your friends, tell everybody. I'm gonna have a very messy kitchen. All right, guys, I will see you next week. Thank you. So much, everybody. Thank you.